Daily Minutes, nummer 1510, met een uitzending van vandaag, 30 december 2018. Dit is het bulletin van zondag. The major part of this broadcast will be in English. Omdat ik vandaag een lang interview in de uitzending heb, is er vandaag geen data. Er is geen uitzending van de RCB en ook niet van de ERRL, dus ik moest vandaag wat improviseren. Om te beginnen is er Onno met een interessant onderwerp. Daarna heb ik een interview dat heel toevallig vandaag gepubliceerd werd. Het is van QSO Today en het interview is met Jonathan Naylor, G4KLX. Als je ook maar iets met digitale spraken doet of hebt, dan zul je dit interview wild interessant vinden. Het begint zoals alle QSO Today interviews beginnen met hoe Jonathan bij de zendhobby betrokken raakte. G4KLX is de maker en bedenker van de meest gebruikte repeater software voor zowel repeaters als hotspots. Voor als ik goed tel inmiddels een stuk of zeven digitale modulatiesystemen. En hij is daarnaast de bedenker van de MMDVM. Dat is een soort modem dat hardwarematig deze software voor repeaters ondersteunt. Jonathan gaat in op de historie van zijn soft- en hardware, die natuurlijk nog heel recent is. We praten over de afgelopen vijf tot zeven jaar. En daarna gaat hij in op huidige ontwikkelingen en op de toekomst. Zullen er bijvoorbeeld meer dan 100 kilo's brede repeaters komen, waar tien gebruikers tegelijkertijd met willekeurig welke digitale mode als een volwaardige digitale repeater over kunnen werken? Foundations of Amateur Radio Over the past year and a half, I've been working on a secret project. Today I'd like to share what I've been up to. To set the scene, I'm not doing this on my own. A fellow co-conspirator is Randall, Victor Kilo 6, Whiskey Romeo, who became a radio amateur about 20 months ago. Randall has a long association with the Engineering Development Array and the Murchison Widefield Array, two of several radio telescopes that are built on one of the few radio quiet areas in the world and located near the future home of the Square Kilometre Array, the SKA. One day, Randall and I started talking, as you do. New amateur, new topics, interesting new fields and ideas. We hit on the idea that radio astronomy telescopes are able to receive two-meter signals. This started a discussion about using a radio telescope to receive a moon-bound signal. So the idea was born. Can we create a 5-watt signal, bounce it off the moon and have it heard by a radio telescope? Randall and I have been working on that on and off since our first discussion. Let me start by pointing out that we've not managed this yet, but we think it's a project worth doing, to forge cross-skill exploration by various different groups. I have a strong background in IT and a few years as a radio amateur. Randall brings with him a wealth of radio astronomy engineering expertise, not to mention signal processing, communications and a myriad other skills. We started to do this on the quiet. Why talk about something that hasn't happened, might never happen, could be done by someone else who'd claim the glory before we did, and so on. I've come to the realization that while those things all hold true, this is a non-trivial project to achieve, and anyone who puts in the work and gets there is welcome to claim the glory. So in the 20 months gone by, while both working full time, we've done lots of things. Let's set the parameters. When we first started, both of us were holders of an amateur foundation license. This means hand-keyed Morse, 10 watts and band restrictions. Because I'm me, I decided that the difference between 10 watt and 5 watt wasn't significant enough to make or break this, so we went with 5 watts QRP. Our license precludes the use of WSJT modes invented by another radio astronomer, Joe Kilo 1 JT. So the signal had to be something else we settled on a manual slow Morse signal. We're using a radio telescope at one end, so it had to be on 144 MHz. Those decisions made, our first project was to attempt to calculate if we could actually achieve this. Conventional wisdom says no, but our ongoing calculations, revised several times since our original effort, show that we're right at the edge of what is possible. We then started the process of determining if the radio telescope could actually hear moon bounce radio signals. We have a limited field of view, roughly 20 degrees around vertical, so the moon has to essentially be above the telescope. The galactic center is a very noisy place from a radio perspective, so it has to be at least 20 degrees away from the moon. Similarly, the sun, also very noisy, needs to be 20 degrees away from the moon. 
That started a process of me learning Python, so I could use AstroPy to create a table with observation times that matched those criteria. I'm still working on that. Having been a programmer for 35 or so years, I'm not a fan. We did some manual calculations to do some test runs and had two amateurs send a signal to the moon, which for several reasons we were not able to detect. Traditional Earth-Moon-Earth -Earth EME communications benefit from ground gain, something like 3 to 5 dB of gain based on the path essentially ducting across the Earth, but that requires the Moon to be near the horizon, so not relevant for our project, since the Moon needs to be overhead. Of course it might mean that I need to travel halfway across the globe so I can get the gain, but that's another project for another day. We get some effective gain from having a very stable signal. You might recall I purchased a high stability compensated crystal module at TCXO for my radio a while back. This project is why I did that. Another thing I purchased at the time is mechanical filters, which also provide a little effective gain. We started the process of acquiring some high gain 144 MHz Yagi antennas, but through some miscommunication with the amateur who was selling them at a really nice price, we missed out and haven't yet bit the bullet on another set. Initially when Randall and I started this, we were working on it on our own. We tried to learn as much as we could and test the waters ourselves. We've been at it now for a while and it's become apparent that this is going to be something that is likely to involve several other amateurs. Some have already been helping. Alan, Alan, Keith, Alec, Lee and Marcin all contributed time and material. No doubt this list will grow as the project continues. At the moment I'm still trying to write code to create a calendar of dates that will suit the radio telescope with the restrictions we have in relation to the Moon, Sun and Galactic Center, so we can actually prove that the telescope can hear an amateur radio signal. We'll need to source some high gain antennas, likely more than two. Once we've done a one-way test, that is me sending and the radio telescope hearing, we'd like to do the same but between two QRP stations. No doubt the road ahead is paved with spikes, potholes and roadblocks, but as adventures go, this one has been sustaining me for nearly two years, and so far it's showing no signs of abating. I'm Ono, Victor Kilo 6, Foxtrot Lima, Alpha Bravo. QSO Today Episode 230, Jonathan Naylor, G4KLX. This episode of QSO Today is sponsored by ICOM America, makers of the finest HF, VHF, and UHF transceivers for every level of amateur radio operator. Visit ICOM at www.icomamerica.com forward slash amateur to find an ICOM dealer near you. And by QRP Labs, makers of the QCX single band transceiver kit and a host of other QRP radio kits and parts for the ham radio builder. Click the link for QRP Labs on this week's show notes page. Please support the QSO Today podcast by supporting these fine sponsors. Welcome to the QSO Today podcast. I'm Eric Guth for Z1UG, your host. My QSO Today is with Jonathan Naylor, G4KLX, in the UK, who is the programmer behind first the enhancement of D-Star systems and computer-based repeater controllers, to creating the MMDVM project along with Jim KI6ZUM of ZoomSpot fame. If you have an interest in DMR, D-Star, System Fusion, or P25, then our discussion of the MMDVM controllers that are now used in digital repeater controllers and hotspots, then this conversation with Jonathan will interest you. We go into Jonathan's ham radio story as well as a deeper discussion into the present and future potential developments in MMDVM in this QSO today. G4KLX, this is Eric for Z1UG. Are you there, Jonathan? Yeah, hi Eric, 4Z1UG from G4KLX. Jonathan, thanks for joining me on the QSO Today podcast. It seems that we're joining you in your kitchen today, in your home in the <laughs> in the UK. Like it. <laughs> right? I I'm just actually thought, on landing. I'm not nicely in the kitchen. It would be even worse if I was. <laughs> well, it sounds, uh, but but there's uh, there'll be some family background noise, and that's okay yes. because the, the great thing about podcasting is is that we're not doing it in high-tech studios. We're actually doing it in uh, wherever we happen to be. So this is our opportunity to speak uh, wherever you happen to be. <clears throat> we met in the elevator at Pacificon in October. That's right. And yeah. I think that we were the only two guys from out of town. I did actually see somebody from Holland, but I think he was the father of somebody who was there who, although he was Dutch, was living in California. So he'd, he'd obviously come over to see his son. So I did actually meet a Dutch guy, but he wasn't oh, licensed. So there you go. 
We also shared a breakfast after the show was over. And this is one of the reasons that I wanted to share your ham radio story with our audience. Can we start at the beginning of your ham radio story? When and how did it start for you? Oh, I was thinking about this. What probably happened, from what I recall, was doing a holiday when I was, a, oh, how old was I, 12 years old? No, 11 years old. I met, met uh, this lad on a caravan site, and he had an amateur radio book. It's an American one, actually. I can't remember which one it was. And we both spent a lot of time reading it, and it looked very interesting. And I um, obviously went back home after the holiday and found out that nearby, and I, I can't remember the exact uh, order of events, nearby was uh, G2CVV. Um, who was actually a past president of the RSGB a good few years before, a guy called Fred Ward, and he used to read the RSGB news on 80 metres AM. And I used to sit in with him when he read the news, because obviously I wasn't licensed, so I couldn't make any noise. And uh, although I wouldn't call him an Elmer in any sense of the word, uh, said, because we actually moved house after a few months, so I sort of lost, not exactly lost contact, but um, he, he stopped being important in amateur radio terms. Um, he did sort of give me a taste of actually a real shack, and it was a shack. It was a proper brick-built building next to his house, full of radio gear, and it was uh, very, very impressive. And I remember thinking, I wouldn't mind having that. And what was it about his gear that impressed you? It, well, it was big stuff. Most of it was valve-based uh, tubes. Uh, made lots of noise. And when it, when the transmitter went on transmit, it went with a big thud. Bear in mind, it was AM. So some very big transformers in there and high-level modulation and all sorts of things like that. It was a Heathkit DX100U. I remember that much. That was the transmitter. And it just seemed very impressive. Um, I, w- I only wish I could see the same shack now with my modern eyes. Because there's no way, apart from the transmitter, I could no way I could tell you what else he had there. Um, I got a feeling he might have had Collins gear, but um, I'll have to pass on that. So, how did you get your first license then? You moved away. Yeah, we moved away. In fact, I moved house a couple of times. Um, I ended up um, meeting a local shortwave listener uh, near Matlock in Derbyshire, which is where we moved to. And um, we both decided to do the uh, exam at the same time, what was called the RAE, the Radio Amateurs Examination. So um, we started that in late 78, I think it was. Um, I couldn't drive at the time. Luckily, he could because he was in his 20s, David. Uh, he's now G4JIK. And so I used to go and visit him every Sunday afternoon. He had some very nice equipment because uh, he's working. So he had, you know, he could bring money in, whereas I was still at school. In fact, I had to get uh, permission from my headmaster to do the exam course because obviously it counted as extra education. But he was quite happy to sign off on that. So I did the uh, night course, which was, I think, Monday evening for six months or something. I uh, did the actual exam. I think it was in May 1979. And it was the first multiple choice exam in the UK before then it had all been written exams, like traditional exams for the most part. Uh, the results came through, oh, I can't remember when, a month or two later. If, yeah. And my first licensed, which was G8TXQ, that dropped through the letterbox, I think it was September 1979. And in those days, that was what was what was called a Class B license, and that allowed operation only on two meters and above, so two meters, seventy sems, twenty three sems, etc. Obviously, no CW because there was no CW exam taken at that time, and so I started upon two meters FM. It's obviously nice and simple, and um, yeah, get me uh, get me occupied for the best part of a year. Now there was an age requirement, as I recall. Yes, there was. Uh, at that time, you had to be fourteen to actually have the license. Uh, I think I was actually just about to turn 14 when I started the exam course, but certainly by the time I took the exam, I was 14, and the, I was almost 15, in fact, when the um, actual license came through. So um, nowadays, Britain is much more like America in the sense that I think you can have an exam at almost any age, and if that had been the case, there's probably no doubt I would have probably had a license at the age of 11, 12 at the very least. You said at the Pacificon show that at that time you were the youngest ham in Great Britain. And then you looked at the audience and you said that maybe still you're the youngest ham in Great Britain. No, not, not, no, not quite. Um, I was certainly the youngest at any of the clubs I went to. Uh, not, not necessarily the youngest in the UK, although probably one of the youngest, no doubt about that. Uh, it's just I used to go to the radio clubs and everybody seemed very old to me. And some of them probably were very old. And so, yes, I was the youngest going to the clubs. And then if I ever go to a club now, I'm still the youngest. And I'm now almost 54 years old. Which is not good, really. It isn't good, really. Well, I think well, I think we should talk a little bit about that, uh, you know, down the line. Uh, let me ask you: Did electronics and ham radio play a part in the choices that you made for your education and career? Uh, yeah, um, certainly. Um, 
the exams I did at school were definitely sort of science based physics, chemistry, uh, mathematics. Uh, eventually dropped the chemistry and moved over to computer science. Um, I did actually start doing a degree in the 1980s, which was joint honours, electronic engineering and maths. And although I got on with the electronic engineering side pretty well, I didn't get on particularly with the math side. But what I did get on very well with was the computing side. And that was a bit of a hint as to where my future actually lay. Uh, luckily, I didn't spend too much time going down that particular avenue. And I changed over to a computer course uh, the year after. Did you get a degree in computer engineering? Uh, I did, but not until about 10 years later. Um, I did a thing called a HND, which was a lower level. And I graduated with that in 1987, did various jobs. Uh, but I always wanted to do a degree. Um, so I uh, eventually went computer contracting, professionally I might add, uh, in order to put some, make some savings. And went back to university in 1994 for three years full time to do an uh, actual computer science degree, which I uh, came out in 1997. I was, obviously, I was a mature student by then. I was uh, just about to turn 30 when I started. Now, when you got your first license, G8TXQ, what was your first rig on two meters or above? Oh, an IC240, ICOM 240. Um, it was synthesized. It was one of the very first synthesized FM radios. And the way you programmed it was to put diodes into um, a matrix inside, um, soldering, I might add, not uh, not pushing. And so you could add, I think you could have up to 24 channels, um, a bit like the old crystal radios, based on this um, this matrix. But that was all. Um, so, and it was a pain because it was a printed circuit board. It was relatively small. It wasn't surface mount, of course. Um, so I only had, I think I had 23 channels in it, in fact. Um, so it, on the one hand, it was restrictive, but on the other hand, I had, I had the local repeaters on, I had simplex channels. It was not totally unreasonable. Uh, and my, bear in mind, my parents bought it for me because I had no income. So it was not a bad radio to start with. And certainly compared to crystal controlled radios, which in those days you'd have to spend the best part of £10 per channel. Now, for somebody who you know, got 50 pence a week pocket money, £10 would, uh, would have cost me an awful lot of money. Well, I think, wasn't there the IC24 or something like that? There was a, the crystal version of that radio. That was the IC22. 22, 22 IC right. 22 looked almost identical, yeah. Mm -hmm. Essentially, if you looked at it, one board, which was the transmit-receive board, which was, I think was probably identical, uh, and it obviously got a local oscillator input from another board, uh, the other board being back-to-back -back with it with a metal shield. And obviously the crystal-controlled one had crystal oscillators there, and this one had a, 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 um, a PLL a synthesizer. Right, I remember that, right. But it didn't have PL, as I recall, so you had to add a... We didn't have that. We didn't have that in the UK. We didn't use oh, it. Oh, you didn't? No. All repeaters in the UK use 1750 hertz tone burst, like most of Europe. PL, or we call it CTCSS anyway, uh, was unknown to us. Uh, we might have read about it in magazines from the States, but uh, all repeaters in, in Europe use 1750 hertz, which actually you can whistle anyway. Right, like uh, with your Captain Crunch whistle. Although I think that was... Uh what, 26? I, I, I can actually whistle it with my, with my lips. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, what you could do, it was, um, you could actually just do uh, like that quite slowly. If you did, did a, a slow whistle like that, that was usually enough as well. But I could actually whistle it exactly. Well, I read somewhere that, that you actually ended up getting into DX and stuff. So did, you, you must have upgraded. Oh, yeah. Uh, essentially, the first summer um, I was licensed, that was 1980. Um, sometime during that year, probably in the spring, I guess, I started doing um, the Morse lessons uh, in Derby with a, Ken, a guy called a Ken G4HDP, who's now Silent Key, has been for a number of years, as is Fred Ward, by the way, the guy who I mentioned at the beginning, because he was actually licensed pre-war. Uh, they've both been dead for a good number of years. Ken wasn't a young man either. So he did uh, Morse lessons, and I did the Morse test I think it was either July or August 1980. And in those days, you had to go over to a coast station in the UK. Uh, you know, the people who actually signalled boats, you know, liners, you know, tankers in the North Sea or wherever. And you had to go over there and you actually tested by uh, professionals who actually did, it, did Morse code actually for their jobs. And I remember sitting there and they had this huge brass Morse key. I never seen anything like it before in my life. And... Um, 
I had to receive some CW. I can't remember what it was. It was some text from something. And I had to send CW, which I think was a cutting from a newspaper, a very old newspaper. And I had to send it to him. And at the end of it, he, I remember him saying, he says, I can't tell you whether you've passed or failed, he says, but you're going to get a G4 soon. So that's <laughs> 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 a nice one. Yeah, so I did that. I mean, the, the exam took, what, 10 minutes maybe? But it was a day out with my parents because it was the best part of 100 miles to get there. But it was a lovely summer's day, I remember. So I had a sort of a, a semi day at the beach, shall we say? That's when you got G4 KLX. That's right. That was actually also in September 1980, uh, almost the year to the to the day, almost. Around that time, uh, a good friend of ours, uh, who, looking back now, was probably more influential than I thought, was G3 ALA, our last silent key, a guy called Charles Holt, who we actually knew as a friend of the family. And he was reasonably active, um, but for various reasons, I ended up borrowing his HF radio for quite a long time. Uh, had it set up in the bedroom. Obviously, now that I was licensed to operate all bands, all modes, full legal power, which in the UK at the time was, uh, well, was 400 watts PEP input, or was it output? I can't remember. And, um, and I remember I had a 10-meter dipole made out of uh, wiring flex in the bedroom about two feet above my head which was more or less inclined in the right direction to cover the states. Although, bearing in mind, the building that I lived in at that time had three-foot-thick stone walls because it was an old coaching inn that we lived in. I had By this time, I had quite large VHF, UHF antennas actually on the roof, and it was a very, very good location for RF. So I, uh, I worked around the world on HF. Um, uh, bear in mind, it was the, almost the peak of, I think, Cycle 21. So working the States, Japan, Australia, at the right times of day was extraordinarily easy. And that may have been one of the problems. It was easy, you know, providing shouted loud enough in the right direction, people came straight back, even using what would be best regarded as mediocre equipment. And to me, that didn't represent a challenge. I need a bit more. Does that make sense? It sure does. What was the borrowed rig? Oh, it was Summer Camp, which was a German version of Yesu. FTDX 400. I remember the output of the transmitter side used what you would call sweep tubes. Um, I think it gave about 100 watts output. It was all valves, all tubes. I right, think it was like one the 6146, I think, was the... Uh... Not not for this particular one. It was something else, I think. Hmm. Good point now. I'm, I mean, I've long since not seen it. So, um, yeah, it may have been. Yeah, may have been. So how did your ham radio experience then evolve from there? Well, essentially, after being on HF for one and working in a good number of countries, I mean, we're not talking hundreds here, but say, you know, high tens. I just thought, I didn't find it particularly, it's all, to my mind, it was just a shouting match. And, you know, the people with the biggest linears and biggest ampl- an- antennas won. And to me, that didn't seem like a lot of fun. So um, I eventually, or went back onto the VHF, UHF bands. I got two meters SSB, for multi-mode radio. Um then after a bit of a while after that, I got 70 SEMS SSB and FM. Oh, bear in mind, I also had 70 SEMS FM not long after 2 meters FM, so I got better radio. And, and also, a few years later, I got 23 centimeters all mode as well with a, with a homemade transverter. And what did you discover there? Is there a lot of activity in the UK? There was then. There was then. Uh, bear in mind, I lived in a very good location, particularly to the east. And, of course, the east from the UK covers places like Holland, Germany, Denmark, um, Belgium. Well, and, of course, when conditions are particularly good, Poland, Czech Republic, or that's Czechoslovakia in those days, Sweden. And, um, and yeah, I was a good location. I had passable equipment. Looking back now, it's probably quite dirty on transmit, and the receiver was... Well, it worked, let's put it that way. And when conditions were good, I lived in a good location, and I, I worked all over the place in Europe on 270 and 23. Um, I think I've got the first, for example, between the UK and Lithuania on 70 centimetres, for example. And I was only two QSOs away from being the first between UK and Poland on 23 centimetres. That's quite amazing. Horizontal Yagi antennas? Yeah, I had um, Tonner antennas. I used to love Tonner. Uh, 16 element on two meters because they moved to a 17 element a long time ago, but this was 16 elements. I had a 19 element on 70 centimeters, which was not the best. I should have had a 21. And I had the 23 element on 23, fed with fairly mediocre coax, but 
you know, in mitigation, the, the ones weren't particularly long. I had about 100 watts on two meters, transistor amplifier, microwave modules, uh, 50 watts on 70 centimeters from a BNOS PA. The, the radio was a uh, Kenwood or Trio as it was then for us, TS770. And on 23 centimeters, it was an ICOM 202 as the driver, two meters. Uh, the transverter was um, homemade from a kit from a company called LMW Electronics, who still exist, but they don't do microwave equipment anymore uh, as a kit. And uh, then I had to, ultimately, I had a five watt transistor amplifier, which I made, which, you know, the transistor itself cost a lot of money, 20 odd pounds, which you know, bear in mind, I was still at college at the time, so my income was still quite restricted. Like 30 American dollars then, I think. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And um, and the, the main amplifier was a 2C39 BA uh, with about 1,000 volts on the anode, um, completely open to the world. Uh, anybody could put the fingers in and hurt themselves, which I didn't do with a fan cooling. And at one stage, for a short period, I actually had a single 4CX250B on 70, which about gave about 200 watts out and unfortunately made next door's uh, television jump up and down, which was probably not a good idea. <laughs> well, it sounds it sounds very interesting. I think, well, you're working right across the water. Now, where were you living? Were you living on along the coast or were you just happened to be in the high ground in the middle of the country? High ground in the middle. Um, lived in an area called Derbyshire which is, is part of, well, we were near, not quite inside, thankfully, uh, a national park called the Peak District. Now, when I say peak, we're not talking thousands of feet here, but certainly some of the peaks are over a thousand feet. And where I lived at the time was the best part of a thousand feet. But like a lot of these things, it's all relative, isn't it? And towards the east, there was another hill not quite as high as me. And then after that, there was nothing higher until he got to the Urals because uh, he went over Holland, Germany. Um, so as soon as conditions opened up, I went straight over the top and into Poland and places like that. How are you known in amateur radio circles today? Well, these days it's uh, the MMDVM and uh, its predecessor development. Uh, the MMDVM stands for Multimode Digital Voice Modem, which, considering how successful it is, I wish I'd probably chosen a better name, to be honest. Well, it's not a bad name in terms of. Uh, it's descriptive. I'll give you it, that. Yeah, it worked. Uh, it worked for IBM all those years, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, I used to use IBM mainframe, so yeah, they got some great, great, uh, great names. And now this message from ICOM America. This is the last podcast of 2018, and while we have spoken about ICOM's offerings for the holidays, you still have a few days left in 2018 to purchase the ICOM radio best suited for your operating skill and interest. The ICOM IC7300 changed the standard design for entry-level HF transceivers. This high-performance innovative HF transceiver with its compact design will far exceed your expectations. It was my personal choice for a new rig this year. Features include RF direct sampling, 15 discrete bandpass filters, a large 4.3-inch color touchscreen, real-time spectrum scope, and an SD memory card slot. The IC7610 is the SDR software-defined radio wanted by every ham looking for the contest or DX rig capable of picking out the faintest of signals even in the presence of stronger adjacent signals. As a result, the ICOM IC7610 changes the world's definition of an SDR transceiver. With its independent dual receivers, you can be in two places at once to pounce on a contact during a contest or explore another band while working DX. If you're looking to upgrade your VHF or UHF handheld this season before the end of the year, then the ICID51A Plus 2 provides new modes for extended D-Star coverage. Enjoy GPS, independent AM-FM receiver, and a free Android apps that go along with it. Finally, you can raise the awareness of radio in general, and amateur radio in particular, by gifting to family members or friends the new ICR30 portable DC to blue light receiver. This powerful but easy-to-use scanner radio is packed with full features leveraged from ICOM's technical expertise in land, mobile, and marine radio in addition to amateur radio. The ICOM ICR30 has a built-in GPS and Bluetooth capability, simultaneous dual-band capability to listen to 40-meter single sideband, for example, and your favorite D-Star repeater or hotspot at the same time. You can even record the audio from either or both channels to an SD card for future listening. So as 2018 winds to a close, check out the ham radio dealer near you for end-of-year opportunities, or go to www.icomamerica.com forward slash amateur to learn more about ICOM's line of amazing amateur radio rigs. 
And when you make that purchase, please tell your dealer that you heard about ICOM here on the QSO Today podcast. And now back to Jonathan, G4KLX. So what led you to, to getting then involved with MMDVM and kind of changing directions in ham radio? Okay. Um, I moved, I spent uh, five years living in Switzerland where I was actually licensed as HB9 DRD, operating microwaves and VHF from, uh, both in contests from top of real mountains. We're talking 8,000 feet above sea level, 10,000 feet, whatever, um, doing with great success. And also operating from home because I lived in a, a location near Zurich called Pfaffhausen. And that was, I think, 2,500 feet above sea level. But everything's relative. Although it's high, the rest of the land was quite high too. But it's still a good location. I used to work DX. Uh, I eventually, I moved to Belgium. This is all work-related, essentially. I moved to Belgium. I did a little bit of operation from there, but not a great deal. I was just doing other things not radio-related. Um, I moved back to the UK almost exactly 10 years ago, middle of November 2008, from Belgium. And I wanted a new challenge. And there'd been an article in uh, the RSGB magazine, Radio Communications, and there was an article about D-Star. And I looked at this. Now, digital voice itself I was aware of, although not in D-Star terms. And I thought, well, this is interesting. You know, it's, it's a new area, new new outlet. So I, I got myself an, an ICOM 91 secondhand from a ham in um, Luxembourg, actually. Uh, switched it on, programmed it up, and uh, there was a local-ish 77. I was living in London at this stage. There was a local-ish a repeater for D-Star. And what struck me about D-Star and what worried me is that everything was commercial. Now, the handhelds, yes, I can understand that. The mobile radios, I can understand that. The repeaters were also commercial. The software was commercial. I just thought, this is just a case of putting black boxes together. There's no, there's no outlet to add or do anything particularly interesting. Where is the amateur radio in there? I just thought this is this is not the way the hobby should go. As I understand, the repeaters were also mobile radios in chassis, you know, rack mount chassis. So, so they weren't even even mountain top compatible. Oh, they were not, were not particularly good. And I, right. the same is actually true of the Yase, modern Yaesu repeaters. They've actually got fairly poor um, uh, RF uh, performance. Really, I mean, if you put it into a very you know a very busy RF environment, they tend to fail quite badly with um, blocking. They're not uh, they're not full full specification commercial by any means. So you, you were concerned that this whole D-Star package did not have a lot of amateur in the amateur radio portion, right? You, you set a few things up, uh, plugged it in, it will go. Essentially, yes, you've got to set up the duplexes or or whatever for the um, for the transmit receive, but you'd have to do that for any repeater, of course. But ultimately, there was there wasn't, you know, where could you expand it? Where you know, if you had a good idea, where could you add your new idea? You know, if, if some if you're happy to do that, that's fine. But that's just not the way I work. In California, we used to call these appliance appliance operators. You know, kind of at the time, it was a bad name for all the people that were buying the Japanese stuff when everybody yeah. was using surplus Motorola and GE. But it really was an appliance in this particular case because there wasn't a lot you could do to it. Absolutely. Um, in fact, we use the same term over here. There's, there's no difference there. And the same term was said about Japanese radios. Um, I've actually got no problems with ICOM handhelds, mobiles, Yesu, Kenwood. They do actually a very, very nice job. I've got a decent selection of uh, such radios here, and and some of the facilities in them are absolutely stupendous. You know, they, they do a beautiful job. Um, so I'm not going to knock that. What I was more concerned was the repeater end of things, because if you got a radio, and you know, I, I learned fairly quickly how D-Star addressing worked. In theory, you could add lots of extra facilities to do this, that, and the other. But as it stood, you couldn't. So yeah, the radio, you know, wouldn't change. And I say I, I don't begrudge any of the Japanese manufacturers making the radios. Uh, it was the other end. And I've never operated D-Star, although I guess I have some capability now thanks to you. That with with D Star, if it was connected to the worldwide net, network, you yeah. could actually push the button to call a friend who was also on the D Star network, but they could be anywhere in the world, and the 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 um, connection could be made. Yeah, that's essentially correct. It, yeah, um, 
what it needed, and this is also true of DMR or anything else, what it needed, it needed them to key up on the local repeater. Otherwise, there would be no concept of knowing where somebody was. So, uh, for example, if the last time I operated D-Star was 100 miles away on a repeater and you wanted to call me, I wouldn't hear you because if I hadn't transmitted onto the local D-Star repeater, the network or the database or whatever wouldn't actually know that I'd moved. So it did actually require that other person to have keyed up on the local repeater wherever they are. It wasn't sort of totally automatic in that sense. So did D-Star have some central brain yes. you know, that, um, that tracked all of the users, and was that proprietary to ICOM? Yes. Uh, yes and yes. Uh, there's a central database, um, and the whole package was called G2. Um, I don't know what the G stood, generation, I don't know. G2. There was a G1, which apparently was used in Japan only or something. It certainly predates my involvement. There was G2. There's actually G3 now, which doesn't add a great deal extra. Uh, but G2 had the idea of a central database, which is run by a group in, uh, I think, Texas, uh, called K5TIT. Um and, you know, it works quite badly, to be perfectly honest. That's not their fault. It's the software itself is actually just not very good. Okay, well, is there something that uh, in, in those days or even now that could be done with the D-Star protocol to uh, make that more robust? Oh, God, yeah. Um, yeah. The case so I, did, and did it happen? Yes, it did. Uh, initially, attempts were made to do clones of the um, standard ICOM software. Uh, not by me, I might add. There, were, there was actually a quite successful clone called OpenG2, although open is a relative term, but it wasn't ICOMS. But it suffered from the same problems of having a slow database access. So if you, for example, if you moved repeaters and you keyed up, the information about you being on the new repeater was obviously sent back to the central database. Um, and then that would all information would be broadcast out so that the database in your local repeater would know where you are. But... The time between you keying up and that information being disseminated was, I think, measured in minutes, which, considering QSOs and everything, was actually quite poor. And in 2010, towards the end of 2010, a group in Germany decided to put together something with equivalent functionality, but with a different underpinning of technology. So they actually created a thing called IRCDDB, which you may see around in DSTAR, which IRC stands for Internet Relay Chat, so they used IRC as the basis, and DDB, I, to be honest, I can't remember what it stands for, to be honest, DSTAR database maybe, can't remember. It's always called IRCDDB anyway. And conceptually, it was identical to the, the existing um ICOM system, except it worked a lot, lot faster. And it also required an awful lot less setting up, although I made sure that when I wrote the software. And although you kept a local database, it wasn't, uh, it was held in memory, for example, so you didn't have to set any database up. It was, it was all transparent. And IRCDDB would update within a matter of a second. So yeah, you change repeaters, and before you knew it, everybody knew where you were again. It's where it should be, of course. Okay, so the, then the idea behind this, or maybe even using IRC, is, is that it was kind of like a parallel network that sent additional information to the participants, the repeater participants um, who may be using the IRC DDB, without necessarily changing the DSTAR protocol. So that you'd still have the DSTAR network, but it was enhanced. It was actually, it ran in parallel. Uh, because the K5TIT people had some very strict rules, probably still do, about who could join their network. And the, the rules were you had to be running ICOM. If you didn't run ICOM, running ICOM software, you can't be a member. And so if you're doing home, by, bear in mind by 2010, I had already created a home homebrew D-Star repeater software that worked rather well, both using sound cards, using DSP techniques, and also using uh, specialist hardware. And there was no way that the um, K5TIT people would let such hardware or software on their network. So the IRC DDB network was a parallel network which was semi-connected. Um, I wouldn't, wouldn't go any further than that. What I might add at this stage is that although with repeater call routing, call sign routing is quite important, what was actually the killer app for DSTAR was reflectors. Um, the idea being that instead of having point-to-point -point calls, the idea that you would go to a particular reflector and you could listen to that reflector and, you know, it's like a, like a channel, except, of course, it was international. Right. And that actually was the killer app. So although you can do call sign routing, the amount that actually goes, goes on is actually very small, I think. So even though ICOM actually created that part themselves, it turned out to be not so important. So 
the reflector side did take off. Now, the first reflectors were uh, called the REF reflectors, and they were actually an add-on to the ICOM software. It's all sat at the side. Uh, it was created by a guy called Robin Cutshaw, AA4RC, who also created some quite interesting hardware for D-Star at the same time, or just after. And, um, and they were quite successful, but the problem is they were very tied in with the um, K5TIT um, solution. And essentially, you couldn't really access the... Um, REF system unless you're a member of K5TIT, i.e. full ICOM, um, not homebrew. And so um, homebrew systems called XRF, which actually use different protocols, better protocols I might add, were created sometime in 2010, I think. And a little while later, the DCS system was created, which, which added on to the XRF protocol and added more features. And all three systems ran in parallel, allowed people to talk to anybody else. So you could, you could uh, turn up on a particular reflector and you could you know make a call do a cq or just wait for somebody else to turn up on the same reflector so certain reflectors would be known f to be regional or countrywide or or just general calling and they were very very successful you know we think of amateur radio as being open source yes in terms that we we build we share uh, we share our source code yeah. So it's not proprietary. Yeah. And I remember um, when D-Star came out, and I'm not knocking D-Star. Um, ICOM is a sponsor, and uh, they're very fine people, so I'm not you know, complaining. But at the time, I, I got the impression that that the amateur community was reacting to D-Star as that it was a closed system, that its, that its technology was proprietary. And then I start seeing, you know, Kenwood was thinking of their uh, proprietary digital format, and of course, Yesu has it. And it seemed to me that it was going to fragment the amateur radio community around very specific technologies. Yes, I know. Do you think that your direction and your approach was a way to kind of put everybody back in the box? Um, in a sense, certainly with the MMDVM and some of the things that have been created. Um, I never got the proprietary bit. A lot of people complained about uh, D-Star. Now, the D-Star protocol itself was very well documented. That's why I was able to implement it without doing too much guesswork. The network protocol is less so because, obviously, it's not on air and they could do what they like. But essentially, anything that's transmitted on air has to be documented. Otherwise, it counts as a, a code or cipher, which, at least in terms of the UK license, is not allowed. And I'm sure the US license is not dissimilar. You're not allowed to have obfuscated transmissions your transmissions should be receivable by everybody um, and so the d-star protocol itself was very well documented by icom as is system fusion by yesu and of course the commercial ones like dmr p25 nxdn dpmr are obviously very very well specified by uh, the relevant people uh, much more so than the amateur equipment uh, amateur protocols in fact what people mostly complained about was the codec, the actual thing that did the voice compression, which was from DVSI. And I, th I could understand where they're coming from to some extent, but I also don't particularly care because ultimately the chips that do it cost $20, $30 each and they do everything. They're very, very good. And I just don't – they're very, very good. Uh, it's also the same company provides the codecs for DMR, P25, almost all of them actually um so although you, you can make that argument about against d-star if you're going to be a purist if you're making that argument against d-star you should make it against all the other amateur voice protocols as well because they all come from the same people oh interesting so the dvsi codec is that used then is that i mean is that the standard for build then building hotspots no you don't need it yourself no that, that is purely if you want to convert from raw analog voice from your sound card or whatever to the format actually used on air that is the only time you actually need one of these chips or software equivalent if you just want to create a hotspot or a repeat or anything like that in some senses you don't even need to know anything you can just pass the bits and bytes completely untouched from one end to the other and it should more or less work what i did do uh, which at the time in amateur terms was actually was fairly new what i did do was to regenerate the audio because the audio has got um, um, extra bits added to it to protect it so that if there's any corruption which you're bound to get as long as the corruption was below a certain level it could be corrected and then your transmission would sound absolutely perfect again um, and so what i did is that with my software 
when it received a transmission, it would look at this voice data, not actually understanding the, the voice itself, you must bear in mind, but it understood how to fix the errors so that when the data left the repeater, usually via the network or via RF, it was as good as it could be. Okay, so now let's talk about MMDVM. Uh, it sounds to me like you had your experience with DSTAR. Oh, yes. And you made some themes and variations on DSTAR. How did MMDVM then come about? That, were you all of a sudden interested in other protocols that were coming out into the market? Yeah, to some extent. I mean, when I got into DSTAR, there was nothing else. You know, it was either DSTAR or FM, at least in, at least in the UK. It may have been not have been true in, in um, US, but in, probably been true in most of Europe as well. It was DSTAR or FM or nothing. And so by this stage, we're, talking, we're now up to about 2014, I suppose, 2013, 14. Uh, I started getting interested in DMR as being the sort of thing that people were talking about. And I started looking at the protocols. And, of course, it's TDMA, which for amateur purposes is a completely new idea, the idea that you can have two channels at once and with very, very strict timing and uh, all sorts of all sorts of things like that. And um, – excuse me a second. Uh, with things like that, it's all new. So as a pure technical exercise, it was very, very interesting. Um, I – went to Dayton in 2014 and I'd been swapping emails with Jay Ranger of uh, Connect Systems and he let me have a CS700 uh, which is a very nice radio and so I was able to actually get act get active on DMR at least from the user point of view and also of course that was the key for me testing later on of course when I started building hardware and software and um, so yeah that's uh, that's my beginnings now now for various reasons that project got stalled for about a year for very good personal reasons. And I resumed the, a pure DMR repeater. That's all I was thinking of at the time, purely DMR. I started that again in, oh, I think it was spring 2015. And around that time, I started a new contract. And this contract required me to live away from home during the week. It was just too far to commute. Not a massive distance, but it was just too far on a daily basis. And so... When I was in my digs, as I called it, which was in the middle of nowhere, beautiful location, couldn't even get mobile phones, no Wi-Fi. It was, on one hand, it sounded like heaven, on the other hand, it could be a pain. I thought I'd got an awful lot of spare time available to myself. And so that's when I really started on the MMDVM because by this stage, I thought, well, if I can do DMR, then why not do DSTAR? And if you do that, this new thing called System Fusion was just starting to rear its head. So I thought, oh, why not System Fusion? Although that came later in the timeline. So my first version did DMR and DSTAR. What is that? Was that, a, was that then a repeater controller that does both of these? Yeah, purely repeater controllers. Hotspots didn't even cross. Well, hotspots in terms of small units that fit in the palm of your hand, which you can now buy, certainly I did not predict. Um, I was thinking more in terms of repeater controllers that would plug into either one or two radios, usually surplus commercial radios like Motorola's or whatever, and that would be then put on a mountaintop, hilltop, whatever, and that would be a repeater. And that is exactly what I thought it would end up being. But... <laughs> Yeah, I mean, what happened is I, I did this contract. The contract ended at the end of November 2016. By this stage, the MMDVM supported DSTAR, DMR, System Fusion, and P25. Now, bear in mind, P25, which is used by public service in, um, in the US, Australia, and a few other countries, is unknown in Europe. It is not used here at all. All public service over here uses Tetra. Uh, which is, a, a, I'd say, a far more integrated system, the wall on Tetra over here. So ambulances can talk to the police, can talk to fire service if they need to. They can be connected across or not at all. It's all very clever and very integrated. Um, so P25 equipment is extremely rare over here, just it's unobtainium. So you either have to import it from the US or Australia. So a very nice uh, Australian ham, Ian, VK2HK, sent me a Motorola XTS 3000 after I made a plea. So I was saying, I will do P25, but can somebody send me a radio, please? And so um, he sent me this radio. So I was able to add P25. And at the end of 2016, my contract at this place finished, which meant I was living back at home again, as I am now, uh, which is great. But it also meant, of course, that uh, I didn't have the excess time available to do development. So things slowed down considerably. Um, and so during 2017, um, I didn't add any new modes, for example. I did add a thing called the DMR gateway, which 
I basically added more flexibility to DMR and obviously little bug fixing came along. But on the whole, 2017 was not a, not a busy year for development. And now this message from QRP Labs. QRP Labs has shipped thousands of QCX QRP transceivers kits to date. The odds of working another QCX user gets better every day. If you're looking for a satisfying kit experience where you end up with an amazing performing QRP transceiver for under $50, let me say that again, for under $50, then you owe it to yourself to go to QRP Labs. We have many home brewers who listen to the QSO Today podcast. For you, QRP Labs also has parts, filters, enclosures, and other handy devices to make your home brewing experience even better. You can use these parts to either enhance your QRP Labs kits or to beef up your own homebrew designs. Be sure to browse Han's entire website. Use the link on this week's show notes page or the one in the sponsored section of the QSO Today website to get to QRP Labs to buy your QCX or any of the other fine QRP Labs kits or parts. QRP Labs is my go-to ham radio kit company. It should be yours too. QRP Labs. And now back to our QSO Today. So what's the user experience of a MMDVM repeater? Because I've, I've actually got a board sitting here. I actually have a repeater that um, I'm building with a friend using an MMDVM board. And I'm kind of anxious to g- get it up and running, one, but also understand what's the user experience if I have uh, multiple formats Okay, that's an interesting one, that is. Um, it, it can be a very good or a very bad experience, depending on how it's set <laughs> up. Now, the RF side is just standard repeater stuff, so that's the right. same as FM. Now then, assuming the RF side's all been sorted out and antennas and everything, the choice is then obviously which which modes to use, which modes are wanted, goes without saying. D-Star looks just like any other D-Star repeater. If you're using IRC DDB gateway as the back end, for example, which is standard, it will feel just like another D-Star repeater with all the same facilities of reflectors, call sign routing, and all sorts of good stuff. Uh, no difference there. DMR, you can connect to various uh, networks. System Fusion, you can connect to either my um, System Fusion network or the FCS system, which was created for the DV4 Mini. P25, you can connect to my system. And, of course, there's an XDN now, which um, you can also connect to my system, which has gateways onto the main NXDN network, which is essentially based in the States. So it's all nicely integrated. Now, in terms of the user experience, it's an interesting one that the more modes you've got um, set up, generally speaking, the busier the repeater will be. Now, on DMR, on some talk groups, activity is very, very high indeed. Now, if you're... If you set up your system such that you are connected to one of these busy talk groups, then it's, there's a good chance that the other modes will not get a look in at all. You know, so your D-Star users will just never be able to get in or any other mode. So the more modes you've got, I would argue that the default of the repeater should be listening to quiet things so that each mode has a chance to be operational. Um, obviously, if you're running only one mode, then... You can just set it up as you like. It doesn't matter. There's no concept of sharing. In terms of purely using, when you're using a full repeater like you're talking about, all modes, if, if the repeater is listening, all modes are listening in parallel all of the time, which means that if the repeater is idle, you transmit on any of the modes, and within a fraction of a second, the repeater will be receiving you. It's, it's not looking for each mode sequentially. It's actually looking for all modes in parallel. And then what that means is is that it's it's the radio that you're transmitting from in the mode that you're using that tells the repeater what to do. It, yeah. You're not sending DTMF tones or anything like that no. to the repeater to tell it to do anything, no, right? No, not at all. In fact, no, there's no DTMF decoder at all. Um, yeah, the, the caveat to that is that it must be a valid transmission, not just the right mode but for example on dmr it's got to be a valid color code for your repeater on d star it's got to have the right rpt1 value etc etc so whatever access system you have for each particular mode it's got to match and the access control is controlled by the user registration so for example um, i have um, an id number for dmr that i got from I think DMR Mark or one of the organizations. Yeah. So it's authenticating users by um, ID numbers. No, it isn't. It can. Well, actually, no. I'll rephrase that. It it, it it does, but it doesn't have to. Um, 
I'm trying to remember how it was. I think it's with P25 for technical reasons, not for political reasons. P25 will validate your ID against the database. For the other modes, it doesn't validate your ID. If your ID is not in the database, or let's put it say, if it's not in the local copy of the database, which is normally used just for displays, it doesn't care. It doesn't care. It'll let you through. Now, you mentioned that if you used not DMR, but you mentioned some of the other modes, P25, uh, System Fusion, that they go to your server for validation? Or what did no, you... there's, there's no, there's no validation. Um, DSTAR is the only... The, the... Jonathan, explain to me and the listeners a little bit about what you said about if you're running this, this repeater in these multiple modes, mm. what are they talking to in order to decide what talk group they're going to talk on? So Yeah, the validation in that sense is not validating who you are. That's the important thing to say. So it doesn't, it okay. doesn't matter if you're G4KLX, 4X1UG or anything else. It's, it really doesn't care. Or your ID number. What it does care about is whether things, for example, on DMR, you have a thing called color code, which is very similar to um, PL tones in the con- conceptually. If, you, right. if, if it doesn't match, you won't go through. And it's just it's just a number, basically, between, I think, 0 and 15 on DMR. I'm not sure. Uh so that number has to match what's set up for the repeater. But there's nothing special about the MMDVM on that. That's exactly the same as a Motorola, High Tira, or any other DMR repeater. The, each repeater has a color code, and unless you have the right color code on your transmission, you won't be accepted. Um, uh, let's on, say I want to talk a London talk group, yeah. whatever that is, um, from Israel, and I've got this MMDVM repeater yeah. on DMR. I select in my radio the um, the talk group for London on the channel that works in Israel. How do I get there? What am I am I what am I talking to? That's actually a question that needs to be more addressed to the people who run the DMR network or networks. And that's actually not actually in my remit. I just talk to those. I don't actually root I just root all the data to them and they do all that sorting out. So uh, compared to the other modes, the MMD VM, once you get get into the system, it's actually quite I was going to say stupid, but that's probably not. It isn't that stupid. It's quite clever. But uh, decisions like that and all the routing and everything like that is actually done by the DMR networks, and that's actually done by different people. You've got Brandmeister, DMR Plus, and things like that. And um, Although I obviously know the people involved, I have no hand in their dev- design or development or anything. Does Pystar, the, does that firmware run on MMDVM? Oh, yeah, Pystar is MMDVM. It's, it's a front end to it. It's a very nice front end. But essentially, behind the scenes, it's uh, it's my work, yes. Uh, Andy, who does it, MW0, MWZ, he's obviously added quite a lot of uh, value to it um, to make it easy to use. But the, behind the scenes, it's all my work, yes. Oh, so Okay, so I understand then. So if I'm putting up uh, P25, or I, I decide to enable P25 on my MMDVM repeater, yeah. Then in the setup mode, then I will actually put in some kind of um, routing server. Like in DMR, it's Brandmeister, and it's a Brandmeister server maybe in Europe or a Brandmeister server close by, right? For P25, then I would look for a, a similar kind of server to be able to mediate connections from my repeater to other connections. P- P25 is a, is different, and P25 in many ways is more like the other modes. DMR is a bit of a one-off. P25 talks to... Well, I suppose you can call it my network. I created it, and um, and you, so you've got a number of reflectors which are hiding as talk group. So we've got a number of talk groups on P25. Uh, you've got a set of European ones, North America. There's actually a worldwide talk group, and there's some specialist ones as well. There's also some uh, Asian stroke, um, Australasian talk groups, however you want to call them. And so, unlike DMR. It's, it's more broad brush, probably down to the lesser activity, because obviously P25 is more expensive, whatever. So um, you would typically, depending on who you want to talk to, maybe sit it on one of the North American uh, talk groups, for example, and then you'd hear lots of activity from North America. I see. So the Pi-Star front end that I would use on my MMDVM controller and my repeater, I would pre-configure a talk group. So that whenever I whenever I talk on P25 in Jerusalem, for example, then I'm going to come out on the predefined talk group that... Um, yes and no. Y- yes, in a sense, you can set a predefined one, but that just merely means it's the one it's going to be on when you start the system up from scratch. I see. Okay. Uh, you can change it from your radio. Um, so if you, you know, if you, for example, if you make it default on the first North American one, 
And in fact, you want to talk to somebody in Australia, it's just a matter of blipping your radio on the right talk group and it'll change over. So now I have a, a very popular ham radio club in Jerusalem that has this MMDVM repeater kind of in the center of all of us. Mm. Some of us are on, on DMR, some of us are on D-Star, some of, our, some of us are playing with P25. What does that sound like if I'm in a conversation on DMR, on one of the talk groups, say, in North America, mm. and somebody decides that they want to operate P25 at the same time? What do they hear? What, 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 what's the, their user experience? That's a good question. I've never really sort of tried doing it. It certainly will not do cross mode. If, if an MMDVM is in a mode, it will ignore the other mode. So your P25 user would certainly not be able to steal the repeater away from you. Uh, there's a predefined timings for that. Right. And he wouldn't be aware of me and I wouldn't be aware of him. That's right. Uh, I think as worst that could happen is he could end up jamming you, you know, in the same way that a carrier would. But I would hope that he would certainly get the hint after a while that he's not going anywhere. But there's always that problem, yes. So if, if there's a DMR conversation, there's some kind of timeout timer, meaning that if I'm, if I'm in a conversation with somebody, then somebody in another mode, D-Star, P25, uh, System Fusion, if they key up, it, it's not going to necessarily kill my conversation. No, no, it's not at all. Only from the point of view of jamming, you know, i.e. having two transmissions at the same time. And since uh, the basis of MMDVM is FM repeat uh, fm receivers then you, your capture effect comes in so obviously if you're quite a bit stronger than he is then right. you, then you know his transmission will be wouldn't even affect you anyway but obviously if he's stronger than you then it will essentially jam you out and the mmdvm would not make any sense of it because it's not listening for p25 but um what what, what mmdvm does have it has a concept of uh, timeouts um, when I say timeouts, I'm not talking about the standard talk through timeouts. You know, if you talk for three minutes or whatever, that's a separate issue. The idea is that once a repeat has been quiet from a particular mode for a period of time, whatever you want it to be, it will, rather, will then go back into idle mode and will then be available for capture in any of the configured modes. But the idea is you set that time, time up so that uh, people don't necessarily lose that mode if there's a, a break. So they might set it to be a minute, for example, or, or whatever. From experience... Do you have a time that this timeout timer is optimum? One minute, three minutes? I actually, I think I, <laughs> I, I think I ship it with, I think, a 20-second timeout, but I think that's probably a little bit too short. I don't really know, uh, to be perfectly honest. I don't actually run a, a full-scale repeater. I only run little repeaters and hotspots here for testing and everything. Um, so all the time is sort of based on my own personal usage. I would suggest that you probably need to be at least a minute, I would think, because obviously if there's a pause in a QSO, you don't want to necessarily say necessarily to lose it, but you don't want it to be too long that people on other modes don't get fed up and think you've got a rubbish repeater. Well, it's an interesting thing because I'm what I'm seeing happening, at least here, it may be happening in the States, is, is, is that uh, people aren't spending a lot of time on the repeaters. They, they go buy a hotspot for 150 bucks. And they, they, they leave that on so they can listen to their favorite uh, talk group in their house. And if they decide they want to talk on, you know, the local channels, they'll even use the hotspot and they're not using the repeater. Yeah. And then be. I'm hearing people put the hotspots in their car and they're not using the repeater. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You, you, yeah. <laughs> I'm trying to see how this is going to – there's this, this cost-benefit analysis that yeah. seems to be going on now. I'm, I'm thinking of it. You know, the cost to put a repeater on a hillside just in travel and maintenance and all that stuff versus putting a $100 hotspot in your car, it's, it doesn't seem like ham radio anymore on the one hand. On the other hand, it, it seems to make more economic sense. That's an interesting question, I'm, I, and I can't really give you an answer. Uh, I certainly didn't say I didn't uh, foresee the hotspot. Um, I should have done probably, but I didn't. Uh, and it's not unknown, actually, uh, myself included, to actually potentially have a hotspot per mode if you've got enough of them. It's not that expensive. So, you know, instead of sharing, you know, yeah, have a DMR on, and there's no problems at all about sharing at all, whatever mode you want. It, it is changing the way things are done. And I think, uh, for example, the local um, DMR repeaters, I'm not sure how many local operators there are on them, to be perfectly honest. They're certainly busy. But that's simply because they're connected to busy talk groups. But in terms of actual number of local users, I think it's very, very low, to be perfectly honest. I see some problems with uh, DMR just because 
if we remember, the land mobile industry was was originally based on community repeaters, mm, where you yeah. had um, multiple companies on the same repeater, and you used the sub-audible tone. Each company had a different sub-audible tone, so that if the microphone was in the hang-up box, um, you weren't listening to anybody but your company, but if you took the microphone out of the hang-up box, you'd hear all the traffic. Mm. So the idea was you were, you're not listening to 20 other companies talking to their operators but when you wanted to make a call, you pulled the microphone out of the hang-up box. You made sure the channel was quiet. And when you keyed up, you were only talking to the, the mobiles and yours. Mm. So I see that you know DMR is kind of, when you're talking about color codes and time slots and talk groups, that in a way, they've kind of digitized this, this um, model of community repeater to, in order to support a whole bunch of companies. But for amateur radio operators... You know, I love DMR from the standpoint that I can drive, you know, to work in Jerusalem and talk on the Baynet talk group, for example, because that's where the people I like to talk to are hanging out. And somebody else driving in Jerusalem, you know, likes to uh, talk on the um, the Israel Nationwide talk group because that's what they like talking on. But then all of a sudden I see that I'm talking and all of a sudden my talk group goes away. Mm. And they're using it now there because they're using the same time slot and that commercial idea of you know how it should work is kind of conflicting with the ham radio way that we're using it do you, do you see that with the existing equipment and the protocols in the radios themselves that there's a way to modify with the repeater controllers and mmdvm and and uh, a lot of open source code to actually modify the user experience to make that better that's an interesting question. What I would say, as a first thought about it, is that I would probably look at the logs to look at your activity. And if you've got two talk groups that are really, really heavily talk used on, shall we say, you could put them on separate slots so that your friend could be on the local one at the same time as you could be on Baynet. And since you're on separate slots, you wouldn't get under each other's feet. So that could be one thing, you know, a matter of just traffic analysis. So if if it comes out that nice and not, if it comes out nice and simple like that, that's great. But if you don't, if it's not that simple, um, to some extent, that is yet again a problem of the actual centralized DMR system, be it Brandmeister or DMR Plus or whatever. Uh, ultimately, if they allow that person to steal your talk group or your slot, then that's actually down to them rather than the MMDVM. But the MMDVM just transmits what it receives down the line. Uh, it assumes that the uplink system is intelligent enough to work it all out. And the problem is, and this is true of all of them as far as I'm aware, so it's, it's not being pointing to any particular network. If that, if that talk group has been stolen, there's actually nothing the MMDVM can do about it because the original talk group data is actually not being transmitted to the MMDVM anyway. So it's not a matter of the MMDVM choosing not to. Uh, the MMDVM doesn't actually have a concept of current talk group as such. Um, it's purely done by the centralised one. So it, it can't actually keep it on that one. It requires help from the centralised network. I see. So MMDVM, and I think you've kind of made this point, the MMDVM is really kind of a, a very simple device that's just on DMR. transferring on DM and on, on the other protocols too, it's just transferring the data out to the various networks? No. On on no on the other protocols it's got more intelligence because the gateways actually allow you actually allow you to sort of choose where you're talking to, but it doesn't use a centralized network. So um, on NXDN, P twenty five, D star, even even my version of System Fusion if you're talking to something, somebody in America, you're talking on the American reflector and your your data is actually going probably to the US. If you then want to talk to the Asian one, your data will be going to Asia. It's not going to a centralized network that does the decisions for you. The decisions are actually handled locally on those, on those protocols. Well, that's interesting. You know, originally, uh, repeaters, regardless of the protocol, whether it's digital or analog, served the local public, served its local community. Mm. And I think, you know, this idea of where every user wants to talk on a different talk group in someplace else in the world, perhaps our expectations are way ahead of where we are right now as a community. Do you think that that's probably, you know, we're kind of jumping way ahead? Maybe. Um, on the whole, I've not really had too much feedback on that point particularly um it is understood that if um, somebody comes along and changes the talk group while you're talking or in between qso's it will it will flip 
and that's true of pretty well all of them. Um, there's no way around that apart from, I don't know, user education, really, I suppose. You know, the idea is be polite to other people. I think the same could actually happen with Echo Link, to be honest. In theory, if you're chatting to somebody on an Echo Link room or whatever you call it, and somebody comes along and puts a load of DTMF in and changes your room, you've actually got to, got to go back in and change it back again if you need to. Um, so in that sense, it's no better or worse than Echo Link or IRLP. You and I, before we started, I had mentioned that uh, somebody in our uh, group here in Israel had put out uh, PA7LIM's PNET system, which mm. is it may have ham radio call signs, um, and it may be mixing protocols, but it's all done over IP, right? Yes. It doesn't necessarily even need radios in order to make that work. Uh, this may be where we're going. Yeah. On the one hand, on the other hand, maybe it will be the way that we actually bring all of these protocols together in you know one big um, chat room. I don't know. What if if you look at PyStar, but this is not specific to PyStar, there's a very clever guy from Chile, CA6JAU, Andy. And what he did, he took um, my software as a basis and he created bridges between various protocols. Um, so, for example, you can go System Fusion to P25 or NXDN to uh, DMR and all sorts of combinations, you know, mapping talk groups and IDs and everything very successfully. And so we already have the concept where you can essentially go from one mode to another within reason, and it's very successful. So we have got a certain amount of convergence. I'm not entirely sure I'm particularly happy about the idea of actually cutting the radio out of the system entirely. With the, with the work that I have done with my software, it would be actually very simple for me to create a piece of software that uses um, a headset like I'm using now, some sort of AMBE dongle like Northwest Digital Radio Cell, uh, plug that into a laptop, run a nice bit of software, and be able to access all of those networks you know, with the correct protocols without any radios being involved. But I decided not to go there because I, did, I, I thought this is not a way I think we should be going. Uh, right, but it's alluring. I mean, uh, <laughs> um, there is a there's some IP based push to talk things that look like they look like radios, but they're actually working on IP um, that you can mount in your car. And yeah. uh, if you're in a place where there isn't a lot of repeater inf amateur radio repeater infrastructure, then essentially you're using the LTE or 4G network as your backbone uh, in order to talk on amateur radio. But is it amateur radio even? Because, I mean, a lot of these ones are Zello and things like that, and as far as I'm aware, most... Right. You're, presumably, you're restricting the um, communications to licensed hams because you're you're the one, you're the gatekeeper. Yeah, but I mean, ultimately, somebody could put in a, a random call sign, which essentially fits the bill, and or even use somebody else's call sign. There's not much you can do about it, really, because you can't even tell if it's actually the real person. Um, I do have I do have some issues with those systems, if they come out on amateur radio, if they stay purely in the IP world, then you know there's no harm, if you know what I mean, because you know you don't actually need to use your call signs anyway. Um, I don't know what to think about such things. I don't have one of my tads, so I'm speaking from the outside. Um, I don't know how I feel about that. It's a slippery slope, I think. Yeah, I've got mixed emotions, and um, unless I mean I've been told it's actually very good, and uh, I know it's actually been used in the UK for talkback on microwaves, for example. Quite interesting thoughts. Presumably the idea is one less piece of hardware to take onto a mountaintop when you've got loads of dishes. Um, so it, it certainly does have its uses, but um, in general, I don't know. I'm um, yeah, conflicted, I think is the term. I could see something like this on a, a microwave, as you say, an amateur microwave network, where you've created a kind of a parallel universe internet using like the ubiquity microwave gear. Well, that's what they've got in Germany. Uh, they've got a thing called Hamnet, which is extremely impressive. At Ham Radio this year, uh, they had HD video traveling the length of Germany via Hamnet and coming out in Friedrichshafen. It was very impressive. It's relatively easily done now. It is, but also I think I'm not entirely sure some of the hardware they use, and you know, you know, the Germans are very, very clever people. So I imagine there's quite a lot of amateur radio in there, not just commercial boxes, but it covers the whole of Germany. So uh, a lot of German repeaters are actually on Hamnet rather than uh, pure internet with microwave links rather than um, ADSL or whatever. Right, that gives them some fault tolerance in in the case of a disaster. Yeah, it does. Yeah, it's going to say not not that Germany is known for earthquakes or volcanoes or anything. <laughs> no, I guess not. What do you think is the greatest challenge to amateur radio now? Getting young blood into it, I think. Keeping it alive. 
keeping it relevant i think is the term i, th- I think the old um, the old ways of doing things you know sitting on i don't know putting special event stations on which happened in the uk and i'm sure it happens elsewhere special event stations that stick an hf rig and a you know, piece of wire out the window talking around the world you used to do it for people but nowadays when you can watch uh, live television from the other side of the world in real time i on your smartphone. On your smartphone, yeah. Because in fact, um, right. you know, I watched the launch of uh, the Falcon 9 rocket with SL Sat uh, a couple of weeks ago on my mobile phone live, more or less. And in fact, the, also the landing of the um, latest, ro- well, it's not a rover, is it? But the latest lander onto Mars I watched last week on my mobile phone in more or less real time. Um, so just talking around the world in itself, I don't think has that effect anymore like it did to my generation back in the 70s when such things were much, much rarer. So what do you think? If you were tasked with the the job of attracting younger hams to ham radio? I would actually push things like digital voice. doesn't matter which mode. The idea is that you can do clever things with it. Satellites. Now, it... That we you know from the point of view, not necessarily the QSO. It's the in that context, it's the journey rather than the destination. If that makes sense, you know the idea is, hey, look at all this technology I'm using. Children or young people of today are very, very happy with technology. They've been brought up with computers. They've probably got Xboxes or PS4s in their bedroom. They certainly have here in this house. Um, so they're happy with technology. So you can show them technology. They won't be freaked out. They should find it interesting. So anything that's technological i.e. what I would presumably call advanced advanced amateur radio, is probably more likely to set them on fire than a black box into a piece of wire. Uh, so, yeah, I'd, I'd show them satellites, digital voice, even EME, but well, that's obviously not particularly easy to do on a you know a portable setup. But, you know, bouncing a signal off the moon, I think that's still quite an impressive thing to do. So I would actually push the more advanced um, areas of the hobby, not to the traditional areas. What excites you the most about what's happening in amateur radio now, besides MMDVM? Well, of course. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't use that horrible thing. Um, I think it's the rise of SDRs, the fact that you know, using fairly simple hardware, it can be massively flexible. You can do all modes on various frequencies. I love SDR, DSP. The idea is that you, you – you're, I mean, obviously, you've got to be reasonably skilled to use it in terms of purely programming it, but – you know, the limitation is your imagination. You know, you can create new audio modes. You know, you don't need to use SSB potentially, although it wouldn't be a good idea to do so. But there's, the limitations have been removed. Um, some of the satellites, we've now got a geostationary satellite, um, SHALESAT, which is being commissioned at the moment, uh, which unfortunately doesn't cover the US, but it does cover the UK and Israel. Now, that's exciting. And although I haven't got any equipment for it, it's something I'm looking to do next year if it works out well. So I think that's exciting. So that's something I'd like to demonstrate. If I was, if I was doing that, I would you know, have a couple of satellite dishes pointing. And instead of – and also the – the satellite has been set up so you can actually transmit uh, TV signals to each other as well. And I think that could have the possibility of being exciting for people to see. And that would potentially draw people in. Yeah, that's uh, that's also very interesting. I've got this idea that it, it seems to me that uh, you could build a rep- repeaters out of SDR radios. Yes. On the one hand, you know, we've gone to this narrow banding. So um, in order to do DMR, we're using, what, a 6KC channel or... No, it's twelve and a half. No, DMR is about twelve and a half KC. It's twelve and a half KC. Yeah, D star, D star, and NXDN fits it in six and a half because of the two talk groups. Well, it just needs to get the amount of right. data. It's how they're defined. So the the idea then, if you're building repeaters out of SDR receivers, and and so therefore your bandwidth could expand and contract based on the users in the area, then it seems to me maybe the next generation of of, of MMDVM would allow simultaneous transmission of these various um, protocols at the same time. Yes, I I've, I remember talking to uh, Torsten DG1HT, the one of the guys behind DMR Plus, or although he has retired from that position now, and he was saying he was working on a repeater that had a 100 kilohertz bandwidth on transmit and receive and essentially it would transmit four modes spaced at say 25 kilohertz spacing so you'd have d star dmr system fusion and p25 say all on separate frequencies relatively close together but completely independently although licensing in that would be quite difficult in the uk i think and probably a lot of european countries uh but the idea was that instead of having a repeated does all modes it does all modes in parallel now using sdr techniques that would be a relatively simple thing to do 
Well, I guess if you could show if you could show spectrum efficiency that expands and contracts based on the number of users simultaneously using it, and when it, when only one person's using it, you're no longer using 100 kilohertz of bandwidth. Yeah, well, his 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 method was sort of fixed, if you know what I mean. That's, you know, the, each mode would be on a particular frequency within 100 kilohertz. That's an interesting point. Um, I'm not sure how that would work with existing radios. I mean, I can see the point of having, you know, for, for example, four DMR channels all from the same repeater, i.e. eight eight slots all together, for example. Uh, that'd be quite an interesting one to do. Yet again, not massively difficult. Problem in Europe would probably be licensing, simply because we have narrower bands than the US, for example. So so certainly in the southeast of England, where I live now, uh, there's a massive pressure on frequencies for example you can't get too many repeaters on and bear in mind all repeaters in europe are coordinated it's not like the us it's you know they are licensed and you cannot put a repeater on just because you want to it's got to be licensed by the national society or similar um so there's no way you could actually get anything like that uh, at least in the uk because down here there's just no free spare frequencies well i think that's true in the united states as well where they've actually reduced the the channels from 25 kilohertz channels to to 20 kilohertz channels Hmm. Well, we're on 12 and a half KC in uh, Europe and have been for about 20 years now, if not long. Right, and I think they probably have some places that maybe, you know, where they're putting the um, uh, the DMR radios. I guess it depends on the market. Hmm. You know, if it's uh, California, for example, where every single channel is used and reused, maybe that's uh, is something that they're they're also doing. I was quite shocked, actually, because I saw, um, I think it's the uh, California... Um, repeat coordinator group or something at uh, Pacificon and they had a map and it said in California there's over 2,000 repeaters and that was jaw dropping because the whole of the UK which has actually got a higher population although possibly probably not a higher population of amateurs has actually got less than half that in repeaters. This is true by the way when I was a kid in the 70s uh, there was hundreds of repeaters already in the southern. In, I grew up in Southern California, mm. and by the way, the repeater group that you were seeing, I believe, at Pacificon was the Northern California Repeater Coordination Group. My been. I've got a photograph of. So the states divided into two coordination groups, uh, yeah. north and south. So okay, um, they may have been talking about two thousand repeaters just in the Northern California. Possible. I mean, that, to me, that's just isn't that amazing. It's, it's mind-boggling, actually, because uh, we have nothing like that. Say, so, I think we're up to about eight hundred repeaters for the whole of the UK, but that is the whole of the UK. So you, you just you're just not allowed to put repeaters on willy-nilly in the UK. Now the only thing is, is that if you go through all the channels, you don't hear anything. Yeah. Because there's a lot of repeaters, but there's not a lot of people talking on them. So yes, it's the NARCC. I just got the picture up. Is that Northern California? NARCC. Right, yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah. I'd say activity is very low. I mean, um, I'm actually just about to change jobs and start a new job tomorrow. But my commute to my old job took me through the coverage of about seven repeaters: two on two meters and uh, five on seventy FM repeaters. This is, and I think I heard one QSO in my whole time. You kind of have to drive in scanning mode just to be able to catch a conversation. Yeah, it's it's, it's dreadful. It's sad, actually, because certainly when I first got licensed, uh, you know, back in the 80s particularly, finding a free repeat or even a simplex frequency was extraordinarily difficult. Nowadays, you've got acres of space, and it's, it's not a good sign, because in terms of numbers, there's probably more licensed now than then, I'd imagine. Well, I think part of that might be the fact that, you know, now people have cell phones. And cell phones means – it used to be that when you wanted to talk to somebody privately, you told them on the repeater that when I get to a landline, I'll call you. Now people just go to the cell phone and, and make the call rather than use the repeater to have the conversation. I would possibly also say it's also a change in licenses, at least in Europe. When I first got licensed, it was two meters and upwards. So if you wanted to do HF, you had to do the Morse test. Otherwise, you didn't, you didn't do HF. Nowadays, almost all the li all the licenses from the UK, even the novice license, allows HF operation of some sort. And so people, you know, especially when you first licensed, will sort of say, you know, why should I talk to Fred down the road on the repeater when I can talk to Australia on 20 metres? And so I don't think – I think a lot of people don't actually bother with 2 metres anymore or 70. It's, you know, it's like, why should I bother with that? You know, I don't want to talk to my neighbours. I want to talk around the world. And I think there's an element of that. No, that may be true. Well, yeah. yeah, I get maybe it varies from place to place. What advice would you give to newer returning hams then to the hobby? Investigate the new elements. 
you know, if if you were doing, um, I don't know, HF uh, operation before on whatever SSB on 20 metres 30 years ago, it's still there. It's more or less the same as it was. Sunspot cycle is not too hot at the moment, but, you know, it's more or less the same as it was. But what I would say is there's lots out there going off, lots of new things that you should really look into. It's, it's, it's an exciting time. Uh, lots of new things that were inconceivable 30 years ago or 20 or even 10 years ago. Have, have a sniff. Have a look around. It's it's good. It's, it's, it's exciting. Jonathan, you've been a wonderful guest. I had a great time with you at breakfast um, at Pacific Time. <laughs> yes. And yes. Um, I'm really glad to catch up with you again and, and have this conversation and share it with the QSO Today listeners. So with that, I want to wish you 73 and thanks so much. Yeah, 73s and thank you for the chat. It's been most enjoyable. That concludes this episode of QSO Today. I hope that you enjoyed this QSO with Jonathan. Please be sure to check out the show notes that include links and information about the topics that we discussed. Go to www.qsotoday.com and put in G4KLX in the search box at the top of the page. My thanks to both ICOM America and QRP Labs for their support of the QSO Today podcast. Please show your support of these fine sponsors by clicking on their links in the show notes pages or when you make your purchases that you say that you heard it here on QSO Today. You may notice that some of the episodes are transcribed into written text. If you'd like to sponsor this or any of the other episodes into written text, please contact me. Support the QSO Today podcast by first joining the QSO Today email list by pressing the subscribe buttons on the show notes pages. I will not spam you or share your email address with anyone. Become a listener sponsor monthly or annually by clicking on the sponsor buttons on the show notes page. I am grateful for any way that you show appreciation and support. It makes a big difference. QSO Today is now available on iHeartRadio, Spotify, Libsyn, and TuneIn, as well as the iTunes Store. If you own an Amazon Echo, you can say, Alicia, play the QSO Today podcast from TuneIn. I still use Stitcher to listen to podcasts on my smartphone. The links to all of these services are on the show notes pages on the right side. Until next time, this is Eric Forz at 1UG 73. The QSO Today podcast is a product of KEG Media Inc., who is solely responsible for its content. Daily Mills zijn dagelijks vanaf ongeveer 1900 uur te beluisteren. De uitzending wordt een dag later om half elf ochtends herhaald. Alle mail is welkom op het adres x xdvme Dat is ook te vinden rechts bovenaan de webpagina van de uitzending in www.pa0ete.nl. De Daily Minutes toont iedere dag weer aan de hand van schokkende voorbeelden hoe een hobby mensenlevens kan veranderen. De internetfaciliteiten en studio hardware voor Daily Minutes worden gesponsord door 70 MHzshop.nl. 70 MHzshop.nl. En microfoon naar retour.